Today's guest on the podcast is Danielle Laporte. You all have probably heard of her for her book, The Desire Map. I had a lovely, lovely conversation with Danielle, and I appreciate her time so very much because I know that she doesn't say yes to a lot of things. So I felt very honored that she agreed to come on the show. So I hope you all enjoy this enlightening episode with the Danielle Laporte. Hi, and welcome to the same 24 hours podcast. I'm Meredith Atwood, author of the book, The Year of No Nonsense. I'm a former attorney turned writer, speaker, and Ironman triathlete. Although right now, all I really like to do is lift weights. We all have the same 24 hours, but it's what we do in those hours that leads to our greatest health, happiness, and success. It's my goal to crack the code on a life of less nonsense so we can all make the most of our 24 hours. So let's get started. Danielle Laporte is joining us. Hi, Danielle. Hello. I'm so glad to speak with you. I'm even more honored because I I heard somewhere when you said you say no to approximately 80% of things that come at you. (laughs) So that Mm -hmm. means I made the 20% and that makes me feel good. (laughs) 20%, 24 hours. It's all working. That's right. So how are you? What is new? Mm, What's new? What's new is... I, I'm making new stuff and I'm doing it in a more sane way. And what's new is, um, how are you doing? My mind has slipped into what's way. old. <laughs> <laughs> I went into the old things like, oh, I still have a hard time going to bed by 10 30 because there's all these things I want to do. Um, how am I doing it in a more sane way? Yeah. Well, the team went through a beautiful organizational development process over this past summer. And we are now running the business, our, our, our topic, our, our way forward. And this all comes through a beautiful coach named Jayla Davison is that we are moving towards being cohesive family farmers. (laughs) And that's like this really poetic metaphor. That's actually really changing how we work. So how do farmers work? They plan much further in advance. Um, People come to the farm to get the fruit. You don't go hustle your 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 goods elsewhere. So like we're just really rooted in if you resonate, click here. If you don't, that's okay. We're just really going to speak to people who are like aligned. I mean, that's always been a thing, but it, it is shifting how we reach out a bit. Yes. And yeah, we're just really in a mode of, I mean, I'm much more community oriented than I, than I used to be. There's lots of reasons for that, but, uh, it's, it's part of that family, uh, farming vibe. I like that so much because there's so much noise, so much mm-hmm. noise out there. And that is an amazing idea to just, if it resonates, welcome. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I, it's been about like 15 years where I've been in the mode of, I just stopped selling I stopped putting any energy into trying to convince somebody that I had something to offer and that they needed it. Just like done. I speak, you know, I have these same conversations in my kitchen. This is the language I use all the time. It's as I'm as poetic and esoteric and edgy everywhere. And if you, if you dig it and if you want to talk about consciousness and, and, and leading from the heart and all of those things that have to do with, you know, a truly holistic paradigm, I'm down. If, it, if that doesn't work for you, like, that's cool. There's other, there's other people to inspire you and there's other ways for you to inspire other people. Yeah. So what does leading from the heart mean? Well, lots of things for me. One is I'm really clear why I'm here, like on the planet. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I don't have any, I don't have any struggle with it. Like I am here to expand consciousness. I feel that I am on the leading edge of what spirit wants to create. Everybody's on the leading edge of what spirit wants to create, but it's like life is 
being is animating itself through me. So I want to show up to be um, as creative, as loving, as conscious as possible to help myself be expressed and to help humanity evolve. <laughs> and for me, th my way of doing that is I'm, I'm very focused on being loving. So th I know why I'm here. And then my job then is to make things all about that. Uh, you know, the, the business exists to alleviate suffering and amplify joy. It took a while to get clear and concise about that. <laughs> and then my next duty, uh, which there's no weight in, it's all joy, is I take care of my son. I take care of my friends and my family. And then, and then I take care of the people who are on my bus. Because if I'm not taking care of all dimensions and aspects of the people who are working with me, then I'm a hypocrite. So I care about people's health. I want to know where, you know, where they are on the scale of mental wellness any day. I want to know what their goals are for their life. I want to pay them properly, paying people, paying women in particular properly, actually paying anybody improperly okay. is actually an act of feminism because that, you know, that toxic patriarchal mindset is always looking for a deal. So there's like, there's no exploitation in, right. in how we people. And yeah. And then after all that is taken care of, then I'm interested in who we serve. I mean, I'm interested in who we serve all the time, but I got to take care of my people first. Uh, and then I hope that we're doing a good job out in the world. And so when <laughs> you haven't always been this way. Have you? Have you yes. always, you have, you, you have always cared this deeply. Yes. 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 I mean, it doesn't mean that I haven't messed up and I haven't been, you know, I've, I've had long jags of arrogance and self-centeredness and, you know, not always on track, but the depth of caring about the future of humanity always been there always yeah. yeah yeah that's um that's interesting I feel like I've never I knew it was going to be like that talking to you because I know just from reading the desire map that there's no one else in the world like you Danielle I really believe that I think you're just such an amazing light yeah. in, in this world and so I just really wanted to know if you have always been that way <laughs> I I don't think I, I I'm there are millions of us there's millions of us who were born aware of caring. Yeah. I think, I think, you know, so many of us born deeply sensitive and I'm not talking about necessarily being oversensitive or empathic. I think those terms get really misused. They're, they're valid, but they get misused. Um, it's just, we're taught to be otherwise. Right. And I was blessed to have somewhat eccentric because they were young naive, uh, parents, mm -hmm. my mom, my mother got pregnant in high school. That really actually worked to my advantage in a lot of ways, having super young parents growing up with them. And then my mom was experimenting and, you know, this is like, this is the seventies and there was like, it was like Wayne Dyer's first book and the Tibetan right. book of the living in the dead. And we were going to workshops and I saw naked people and I heard about <laughs> channeling and, and metagenics and metaphysics and bioenergetics. So that helped, but, uh, yeah, I'm in, I'm in to serve for sure. Yeah. yeah. So we can get really overwhelmed. I mean, you have this desire to serve just, it's in your it's in your core, but we can get really overwhelmed. Some of us who maybe don't ha don't feel that as deeply, but want to. I mean, we, we get overwhelmed trying to make a positive difference. Yes. In this in this environment, at times. I mean, I feel myself even doing it. I'm like, how do I reach more people? How do I do more? Mm -hmm. And it mm -hmm. becomes this like frantic, almost jockeying for for our self worth in some way. I want to help you, but this is tied to my self worth. I mean, what would you? tell us to do about that like what or what would you what advice would you have besides calm down and be still <laughs> uh this is such a a great conversation to have uh here's what i i know about myself 
I have been, I am a recovering workaholic Mm -hmm. and I use that term with reverence. Like it's not a like, Oh, workaholic. Like, no, it's an addiction that has had very negative impacts on my life. And part of the reason as a workaholic is because I was, I mean, I mean, there's, there's lots of layers to this, but I'll just get down to the deep layer is really trying to prove my worth to God. Mm -hmm. Just like that basic. Am I worthy? Am I worthy of everything I want? If I do enough for the rest of humanity, will you fulfill my desires? Do, do my prayers get answered? If I'm, if I'm, donating enough, if I'm showing up, if I'm talking to as many people as possible, as often as possible about consciousness. Am I good? Am I good? Am I good? Yep. Okay. So not cool. (laughs) Not useful. I don't like that you're reading my mind, Danny. Like (laughs) that dialogue sounds so so many people (laughs) vibing with this. Yeah. So here's the reason that's not good. Well, I mean, we just all inherently get how unhealthy that is, but that will burn you out. That will have take such a toll on your adrenals, just your whole body system in general, and your relationships, et cetera. And when you are burned out and not able to sleep at night, and your hormones aren't balanced, and your brain chemistry is all messed up, and you're not, your body isn't what you want it to be, you are not in any condition to be of optimal service. You cannot be a conduit of love right. in the highest order when you're all janky like that. So let's not do that. So my learning is that my learning and a belief, and I'll go so far to say like, it's annoying now. I'm good. I'm solid. I'm in life loves me. God. And I chose for me to be here. I could do nothing. I really have to stretch to, to believe this, but I'm playing with this idea. I could do nothing. I could just live I could just live and garden and have some other quiet job that wasn't making, I wasn't communicating with more than one person a day. And I am still a beloved of creation. Good. Okay. And (laughs) I do want to, sir, I am, I am, I am lit up when I give. I, it's a joy for me to try and make a difference. And when I am myself, when I write a poem, when I show up and have a real conversation, when I can write a prayer for something, when I can put a meditation out, whatever it is, and this is different for everybody. It could be, you could be a personal trainer. You could be a kindergarten teacher. When you are full, like when you are in the flow and doing what comes most naturally to you, you are being of service to Everybody to everybody. Yes. And so the, the, there's the third layer to this and the planet's on fire. Let's, let's, let's double down everybody, shall we? So what does double down look like? Double down looks like you're going to get enough sleep. You're going to eat clean. You're going to make choices that are life affirming that keep you in your joy. You're going to get out of your joy. You're going to get in pain, despair, suffering and doubt. You get back to your joy. Get the therapy that you need. Surround yourself with people who are a yes for life. You be well. Okay, do that. Then you get really clear on what you're going to actually do every day to make this planet a more loving, balanced place and to put the fires out. That's it. I mean, commit. Right. Well, you said you used to be a workaholic. And I came across something that you said, I forget, maybe a podcast, but you had said that you reprogrammed your entire nervous system. And this perked me up so big, 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 because Mm -hmm. I've uncovered some trauma in the last year and a half. And Mm -hmm. I've learned that my nervous system had been a wreck for so many years, probably since I was very, very young. Mm -hmm. And so this idea of reprogramming our nervous system. I think this is something that nobody's really talking about. Mm -hmm. But we might need it. Well, there's, there's layers. One, it's, we're going to replace negative 
psychological messaging and imprints. First of all, we're going to figure out what they are. (laughs) What were we told and shown? What do we believe and how have we been living according to that, that lie? So in so many ways, we're told that we're not worthy. Don't speak up. Don't use your voice. You're less than love looks like this when really it's not, it's not what love is at all. And so we're just like, Oh, love looks like this. Let me go find it. Right. Oh, you don't listen to what I say. You don't choose me, but that's what I think love is. Cause nobody listened to me, you know? And so we'd get into all those relationships. So then we have to recondition ourselves. So for me, how I've done that is I worked with, I mean, Terry Coles, who's a dear friend of mine, speaks a lot about this. She's a psychotherapist. And I work with a psychologist named Ann Davin, who's really just been a huge salvation for me. And basically, the idea is that you're replacing negative pleasure with positive pleasure and negative pleasure for a lot of us has become an addiction. So like the, the simplest example most of us will relate to is our phones. <laughs> <laughs> so every time the, the dopamine hit of like connection and like, it doesn't even have to be people liking you on Facebook or Instagram. It's just like, look at that beautiful picture. Oh, look at someone who looks like me. Oh, look like someone, look at someone who I want to look like. And you just feel connection, connection. But that has negative impacts. Positive pleasure are things that you do that actually have positive impacts, like the pleasure of going to bed early. Mm, so the rare, pleasure, so lovely. Right? <laughs> the pleasure of a meal that is plant-based, which is better for you, that is prepared with love and not full of chemicals and sugar. Now, that's another great example of the food, how bad food, become our, 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 we become biologically addicted to that, physically addicted to that, but it cre- it's creating pleasure. We got to break the addiction replace the negative pleasure with positive pleasure. And what you eat actually changes your what you're attracted to in terms of food. And, you know, I'll just bring this one home. Like I can walk into any cafe right now and I don't crave the scone. In fact, I'm kind of repulsed by it because I know that this is just my, my body knows what's good for it now. Right. My body likes to go to bed early. I actually like to hang out with people who are loving and who choose me and who see me and laugh at my jokes. <laughs> <laughs> That's positive pleasure. Yeah. Right. right. My son made dinner the other night. He's 12. He made some pasta and some salad. And I walked in and my husband and I were running in 10 different directions. Like I had to be somewhere. He had to be somewhere. And this 12-year-old boy had made dinner and he had poured seltzer water into glasses with ice, which is rare sometimes for us. And he had lit candles. And we sat down at that meal and it was like the best meal I have had in years. And it was just because the 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 food was healthy the circumstances were amazing and there was love it was it was people i wanted to be with and my husband and i looked at each other and thought this should be every night why right. are we not doing this every night and so like we've started lighting candles at dinner but yes. it was incredible how simple that was and how easy that is to change and yes. we just weren't doing it yeah, say, sacred, just like sacred, atten- just attention. Attention is sacred, you know, and it is a small thing. We, I was going to say we should be, but whatever, do what you want. Um, it's a powerful thing to light a candle with every meal. I mean, at, yeah. least, at least with dinner, light a candle. Because one, just, I just like beauty and attentiveness, and it really sets a tone. But also, you're calling in the element of fire. Like it's a little prayer. Every flame is like this little earth miracle. Mm. And uh, it's powerful to call that in. Yeah. 
How do we help our children and the young people in our lives not get caught up in the rat race that so many of us have been caught up in? Like, I know we lead by example, but how do we really teach them to, to connect with other people, mm-hmm. with other humans? And, mm-hmm. and, and how do we, how do we do that? I, I, I worry about it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, the obvious one is lead by example. So put your phone away, look them in the eye and then have some standards around that. Like I'm really vocal, like let's go for a walk and leave our phones at home. And when my kid calls me on it, like, hi, hello, I'm right here. Um, I let him know that he just nailed me like, right. Sorry. Hi. Hi. I'm here. Okay. Right. So there's that also just like the fundamentals of parenting one thing that really influenced me. So my son now, he's like a teenager and I'm going to cry if I think about him like moving out. I told him like he's never moving out, but (laughs) (laughs) Um, I read a book when he was little by Gabor Mate and oh gosh, what's the other guy? Gordon Neufeld called hold on to your kids. And the idea here is it's about what they call creating parent centered relationships with your children instead of peer centered relationships. Oh, and they really build a really strong case. And I took, a, it, I needed some convincing on this, uh, but uh, really the malice of technology in the, the parent child relationship. And this, this, the most like clear example is, you know, when I grew up and probably you remember like our phones were attached to the wall with a cord. <laughs> right. And and that meant that your mom or dad or your sibling would answer the phone and they knew who you were talking to. Wow. They knew I it was not even think of your right? right. They yes. knew who you're calling. And then they could probably overhear your conversation. Right. They were vibing in. Now everything's in these little containers. So I so, and let, let me finish this philosophy of, of Gordon and Gabor. It's so important. Basically, this sounds so righteous, but but it works. Basically, you want your children to know that your approval is what matters most, not their friends, not their teachers, not anybody else in your family, yours. That they are living in a way to please you. That's actually quite healthy. I mean, there's all sorts of shadowy, shadowy stuff that happens in that, but uh, as opposed to getting the approval of their peers. Mm. So for a period of time that you really are their best friend. And I would say to my kid, this, this, this makes me happy. This is impre- impresses me. This is what I think is right. This is what I think is wrong. doesn't matter what they think. I am pleased with you. And, and that's healthy. That's healthy because you are the moral compass because you are the main conduit of love, just shining your light on it. And you just want to shine light all the time. That's beautiful. That's right behavior. That's ethical. That's good. That's healthy. Let's go, go, go. Yeah. So some things I put in a place with my kid early on was, was when he did get a device and He's a super healthy guy, so I let him have a phone really early on. Mm-hmm. We're really clear. Until you are 18 or until I give you notice, I know your passwords for all of your devices, and that's the way it is. I am going to ask you who you're texting and who you're talking to a lot, and you're going to tell me without resenting me. I don't want any <laughs> guff when I say, who is that? And it actually happens that way. There's not a lot of eye rolling and he's like 16 now. And, um, yeah. And that, that helps. And we try to, we put our phones away at a certain time at night. It's not as early as it should be. We're just about to have another discussion, <laughs> <laughs> like recommit. but like phones are off their way. They're not in our bedrooms. Uh, it's not the first thing we do in the morning is check our phones makes a big difference. And also, I've been very verbal all the way along about what I believe to be healthy and what I don't think is healthy. So when he came home from grade, from kindergarten, sorry, from daycare, when he was four and said, um, you know, so-and-so teacher at daycare said, we shouldn't talk to strangers. 
I said, that's wrong. That's crap. So we had a crap meter that was established really early on. <laughs> and then we engaged a lot in media. And I would say that that woman, her, her body is not real. Those are fake boobs. Yes. Those are fake lips. That's all airbrushed. Not true, not true, not true. And we had, and I'll, I'll end with this one, a lot of conversations very early on about pornography. Yes. And that opened up a whole world of dialogue about what's real. And my kid just deleted his Instagram account a couple of weeks ago, one of my proudest moments. Wow. Yeah. Well, we had a conversation with our son, what I thought was way earlier than necessary. And it turned out it was not. I think he was 10. Uh, yeah. And we mentioned it. And he's like, oh, yeah, I've already seen some of that. And I was like, OK, it's on. We're discussing you know, these things now. And, and I agree with you. The more we can say this is what's real, this is what's not real. Yes, I, th- I think that's so important. My, my kids are 11 and 12, but... I, the dialogue is important. And I don't know, you said you had parents who were pretty open, but my, I came from parents who were not mm-hmm. like that was not mm-hmm. discussed. And so, mm-hmm. you know, I suffered in a different way, not having a clue about anything, <laughs> about anything, but that's really, really great insight. One of the things I've heard you talk about before is sort of the punishment mindset that we can take on, um, just when we don't face our painful circumstances or our past and we, we do certain behaviors and habits to punish ourselves. What do you, what do you, what is your take on that? How do you get out of that mindset and what do you have to face in order to do it? These are great questions. Thank you. Um, and by great, I mean, they're so helpful for other people. <laughs> and by great, I mean, I know the answers. <laughs> oh, because, so this goes back to trying to please God and feeling unworthy of unconditional love. So once you get that sorted, <laughs> which I think is like, a, you know, it's a lifetime journey and right. there's to be dark nights and all of that. Um <sighs> I think we have to wake up and realize we're addicted to metrics. Yes. Yes. Like sure. I totally get the value of a Fitbit. I really, really understand. I think there's times in your life for that. There's, there are times to measure things that have everything to do with our biology. Like I weigh myself. If I could get one of those, if someone wanted to loan me one of those rings that measures your sleep patterns, I'd be interested in seeing that for a month, but enough, enough, because we are placing our value of our, like our human worth of our spirits on how many steps we take and how many clicks and how many dollars and how much we get done every day. And this is why I'm going to swear. This is why our society is so profoundly fucked because we have placed value of productivity above feeling and meaningfulness. Productivity is our measurement versus are we living meaningful lives? Do we have value as humans? I think every, you know, just this is like a grand statement, but I think all of our pain and environmental degradation and rape culture and, and, and division, it just all stems from a lot of it stems from that. So how to not hook into that anymore? Well, you know, I have most of my career is based on something called the desire map, which is about living according to how you want to feel. So I think when we get clear that our feelings really are the heart of the matter, um, we make different choices and it's not about the goal necessarily. Goals can still be a great thing. Although I'm so much, I am profoundly un goal oriented. Um, once we get clear on that, we, we don't measure things. We don't measure the same things. We don't measure as many things. Right. We're more tuned into how we want to feel. 
we are attuned to spirit. Yeah. You just mentioned, you mentioned goals. I actually recorded a podcast recently, just me jabbering about goals and how they just blind you. I mean, they can just blind you. They can blind your, your health and your choices. And before you know it, you know, like you mentioned adrenal fatigue earlier, you've messed yeah. up your whole system. You're not sleeping. You're doing all these things because of this one goal. And I mean, I think goals as a concept are great, but m- not really because what you talk about <laughs> in, the, in the desire map, they're, they're two different things. I mean, desires and goals are two different things yeah. and we're getting them confused. Yeah. I'm talking about, I mean, what I, what I call them is your core desired feelings. Those are very different from desires and stuff yeah. and accomplishments. And yeah, it's less, like we live in a, a dualistic reality. I want stuff. I want to accomplish things. I mean, I'm launching a new program. Would I be happy if we get X amount of people? Totally. Are, is everything designed to get as many people in as possible? Uh, totally. But it's rooted in service and it's rooted in, I'm going to get there. Th- this is the key. This is really important, I think, for everybody to 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 get Where I want to go is I'm going to feel the way I want to feel every day to get there. So how I I used to operate is like I have this goal and I knew it was going to make me feel lit up and expanded and abundant and divinely feminine, all those great things, beautiful things. But I was going to do whatever it took to get there. So I'm going to stay up late. I was Mm -hmm. going to drink. I mean, mean, one of my epiphanies was, was really was one of the seeds of desire mapping is it's midnight. It's way too late to be working. And my tea on my desk is cold. I'm drinking cold tea. I'm hungry. And I'm answering one more email. I just thought, this is not the, I don't want to live like this. And I don't care if I reach the goal. Is it, I, I want to go to bed. <laughs> I don't want to be with the person who was my husband at the time. I went, you know, I got a kid. What am I doing? And so now, you know, my, my, my core desired feelings are, are things like grace and vibrancy. Those, those are two of them right now, grace and vibrancy. So every day I have to be doing things that make me feel graceful and make me feel vibrant. So when I hit the goal, even if the goal isn't what I wanted it to be, we don't make it or it flops or whatever. Well, I felt vibrant and graceful yesterday. I can figure out how to feel that way again. And so many of us are numbing everything. I, yeah. I'm four years sober. I spent two decades numbing my entire feelings, all of them, good, bad. I was just numb um, and it yeah, came I, out of trauma. I asked trauma. Yeah. Sober, sober from what? Alcohol. Okay. I was at least a two bottle of wine a day, sometimes more drinker. And until I figured out, well, I mean, I quit drinking because it got crazy. And I just thought this can't be good. <laughs> I'm circling the drain. This can't be good. But three years after I was sober, I started to uncover more things and why. And I understood why I wanted to numb my entire life. And this numbing is what I see in so many of us. Like we don't even know what good emotions to go after. We don't know what we want to feel because we're just numb. Yeah. What What do you What do you think about that? About the numbing? Well, I just want to say it's very helpful that you share your story. Yes. Yeah. So thank you, thank and you. it's beautiful, and it's the medicine everybody needs. Because there's lots of humans right now going, I'm drinking two bottles of wine a day, or I'm working till midnight with a cold pot of tea. What am I, you know, numbing out from? And everybody gets not alone. So the difficult news is that it's difficult work. And the work to be done may take you out for a while. Yes, that's so true. Yeah. That's so true. And... 
I'll tell you, and you're telling people, and there's millions of other people who tell you it's worth it. So there's the scary thing. There's not a scare tactic, but just like, let's be super real. If you don't do the work, things are going to get really bad. They're actually going to be more painful than the work you're afraid of. So, you know, just basically bad things happen. You lose people you love and you're not healthy and you develop illnesses and things get really shitty to get your attention. Mm. So there's that. So just, just like that's what's down the road. So take a left turn and it's bumpy and you may need to take time off work and you may need to leave relationships and you're going to cry. You're going to cry in therapy and you're going to cry yourself to sleep and you're going to have, you might have, terrible anxiety and you're going to question your sanity and that is you coming to life yes you're being reborn and through that and on the other side of it oh wow strength the body you want um a, a good heart rate clear skin orgasms nourishing relationships more prosperity, flow, and meaningfulness. Meaningfulness. A life that you want to live. Relationships with your kids. You're going to have, you're going to be in integrity in all your relationships. You're going to clean shit up. And then, and as you're doing that, you're actually going to start to feel nature. You're like, wow, the water I drink matters. I'm really starting to feel the pain of all these trees being burned to the ground. I mean, it just goes on and on. It's so, just go ahead, just die. Just die and come back to life. So yeah. much, so much better. It's so true, so true. And, and people have done it before you. Like, like you and I are here saying, sister, brother, people, humans, however you identify, get to the other side, it's worth it. And here's one thing I, I would, I, I wanna talk about more, I think it needs to be talked about more. There is this morphogenic field of energy that all of the the tears and the growing and the expansion that so much of us have gone through, we've contributed to that. You can lean on people who are in despair right now. You can lean on that. There are people who were as low as you are, as broken, as in denial, as numbed out, and they got through it and they contributed to this, to this bank of light yes. and you get to draw on that. Yeah. Oh, I love that. I love that. Well, one more question. Well, first of all, I want to talk about your new program that's coming out in January and everyone can get on the list now. So let's talk about that first. It's called Heart Centered. And basically, it's all of my therapy. <laughs> <laughs> it's years of all that. How it's, long is this program? <laughs> uh, uh, well, here's how it's going to work. Here's why I'm, well, I'm doing it for lots of reasons. One, you know, is back to alleviating suffering and amplifying joy. But who I really want to impress, other than millions of people, are my girlfriends. So if I can get my sophisticated, neurotic, ambitious, want to save the world, sexy, anxious friends to actually subscribe to my stuff and use it, then I am winning. <laughs> and I asked them all, I was like, what do you need? Like, what would, what would you actually use from me? And they're like, oh God, first of all, I want you to just tell me what to do. I was like, really? What do you mean? What do you mean by that? And they're like, I'm busy. I'm, I'm overloaded with information. Everybody's texting me. I'm running my kids. I'm running my business. I'm running my career. I'm tired. So I trust you. Tell me what to med. Tell me what the meditation is. Give me a little bit of what it's about, and then text me and tell me when to do it. And they're like, oh, I, I can do that. Okay. Mm -hmm. And they're like, and I want you to go really deep. I want you to be as weird, like be your weird self, like you are with us, where you tell us about stuff like Archangel Michael and why you pray and why you do the salt bowls and why you do the thing and how you cut the energy cords. Just be really fucking esoteric with us. <laughs> Uh, all right. And I will read your stuff. I was like, well, how much stuff? And they're like, if you wrote something long and beautiful, I'll actually sit there with my tea and read it. So that's what heart centered is. 
It's devotional practices that I'm going to deliver every week for the rest of eternity. And yeah, so oh, people awesome. can, like if you're interested, you can find out more. You can actually register in January and then in February in sync with the lunar calendar, we begin. I love it. I love it. So one more question, Danielle, this podcast is called the same 24 hours, meaning we all have the same 24 hours in our day, but it's what we do with those 24 hours that matters. So what is something that you do on a daily basis that really contributes to your best life? Mm. (laughs) I wake up and I thank God for breathing me. Something is breathing me. Something's keeping me alive. So I'm thankful. I wake up and I, and I'm, and I give thanks that I'm alive. And then this is a double entendre, which is really central to my life. I give thanks that I'm here to serve with joy. And the, the double meaning in that, I'll just break it down, make it just in case anybody's really tired right now, (laughs) is that my joy is of service that I am really, it's really not only is okay, it's optimal for me to do things that make me happy and that I am going to serve and do all the other things, raise money to plant trees and be kind to people. I'm going to do that. Sometimes it's really difficult, hard work, be loving. I'm going to do that with joy if I can that day. I love that. I love the idea of the second your eyes open in the morning saying thank you for this day because so many of us roll over and say, oh my gosh, not another one. Mm -hmm. And just the way you start your day can change everything. It does. Yes. Thank you, Danielle. Oh, this was so rich. Thank you. Thank you for joining me on this episode of The Same 24 Hours. Remember to rate, review, and share this podcast. It really matters. I appreciate it. See you next time.